This Week in Startups is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twist. And shipstation.com. Try ShipStation free for 30 days and get an additional month free using the promo code TWIST. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And as we've talked about before, uh, books, a lot of books coming out these days. And I really hate when my friends hand me books and I think to myself, my God, this person has accomplished nothing in their life. And they're writing a book, and now I have to pretend I'm going to read it. Well, today's guess is the opposite. Tim O'Reilly has accomplished much and is one of the great thought leaders in the history of technology. And finally, he's written a book. It's coming out October 10th. I'm halfway through it. It's amazing. It's something that all founders should read just to have an understanding of the playing field and where things are going and how he's mapped out uh, with O'Reilly, you know, all the books he's published and the conferences. He goes into detail about the history, uh, and so it's part history part biography, but part roadmap and how to think about the future. The name of the book is WTF, but it's what's the future and why it's up to us. Uh, it's a polemic. It's uh, a roadmap. What, how did, what's your thinking on the book? What is the book? Well, uh, fundamentally, it's a reflection on my life in technology and in particular, my life observing the great platforms in technology and uh, interacting with them. And then what those platforms teach us both about uh, you know, how companies should be designed, but also what they teach us about the economy. Because it seems to me that uh, there are a lot of people who understand that there is something wrong with the economy as we are practicing it today. It's not producing value for everyone. And guess what? You see this in the history of platforms. You know, I, I really began my career in the era, actually in the mini computer era, but let's, let's avoid that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, really flowering in the, you know, the early days of the PC and, and, and then the rise of the internet. And, uh, you know, I was on the Unix and then Linux and open source side of, of the ledger. And what I watched was how the PC started with this just burst of innovation and all this opportunity for startups. It was just like the internet. I mean, obviously not at the same scale, but there were, you know, thousands of small software companies. Uh, PC makers. You know, uh, PC makers. And then you watched that ecosystem become dominated by a couple of companies, become much less, uh, you know, uh, you know, open for new new entrants, right. and everybody went somewhere else. Hmm. And you know, and so I, I, I watched that, and I, I also looked at the new ecosystem that was built with the internet, and it started out again with this wonderful opening hmm. uh, and opportunity, and then we've watched as it too over 10, 15, 20 years has gotten closed down harder yeah. and we've seen different variations of that you know where the, the you know the move to mobile the move to social kind of restarted the the clock so to speak but that pattern of companies becoming so dominant that they forget that they are part of an ecosystem right. and gradually strangling it right and then i kind of you know what i started to think about was how that's a general description of our economy mm. and uh, in a lot of ways the book was a response to the uh, idea that technology sort of inevitably wants to eliminate jobs and so th this is sort of another thread so it's like these platforms well these platforms you know one of the things we learn about them is that they have kind of some master key that makes them super successful mm. and uh and in terms of their own operations, that master key gets translated into sort of an algorithmic pattern. And of course, increasingly, that is literally an algorithmic literally pattern. An algorithm, yeah. And uh, so I kind of trace the history of, of, of how, you know, like, for example, so I, I kind of go through my interactions with some of the various platforms, you know, how Amazon rethought itself as a platform, uh, kind of the whole issue of, of how Google manages search quality. And what do we learn from that? Right. And what, what, I, what I take away from that story is, you, you know, just and also the, the ad auction is Google figured out hundreds of different factors that they could apply towards this master fitness function of relevance. Mm. And so we understand that 
algorithms have a fitness function. Hmm. And then when we look at Facebook, we see that they had a different one. You know, Google basically wants you to come to a page, I mean, come to their set of, of links and then go off to some result. That was their original business get model, so to speak. Get an answer and go away. Yeah. Facebook's was, we want you to come back. We want you to stay. We want you to be sticky. So they, they had, even though they're very similar as a platform in some ways, ad-driven and so on, very, very different business model. Different goal, too, for the right. users, right? The goal That's right. for Facebook is how long can we keep you engaged? The goal for Google was how quickly can we get you to the data you want for right. seeking the information and let you get on with your day. Right, and so th there's actually a, a, a whole thread in the book, too, about how do you understand a business model and I want to come back to that, yeah. but, but let me, let me uh, because even though they're both ad-driven companies, right. their business model, which is the way all the parts of a business work together, uh, is actually quite a bit different. But what we saw from the whole fake news problem, just as we've seen previously in uh, various attacks on the Google fitness function, is you have bad actors, you have people who you don't fully understand what you're doing, uh, and you're, it's this exploratory process, and you have to fix it. So I, I kind of look at, at you know, what we understand about the fitness function of algorithms th through what happened with Facebook. And then I go from there to look at our financial markets because in some ways they're a key part of the platform for our society and the changes in the fitness function hmm. uh, and, and to what extent that is at the bottom of the economic malaise, what does it mean, inequality. Fitness function? I, you said well, it's a term. I mean, basically, in, in AI, Define you actually talk it. about a loss function. Right. You know, it's basically how do you optimize. But I actually kind of tied it to uh, an earlier version of AI genetic programming because it fits in really nicely with actual genetics mm. and the whole idea that, that that there's a fitness landscape for organisms. You know, where where where, where um, you know if you're at a peak of adaptation to your environment. Uh, if you think of it as a landscape of peaks and valleys, mm. uh, the only way to get better sometimes is to go down. Crash. You know, so like you couldn't, Microsoft couldn't go from the PC to the internet without letting go of some of the things that they uh, had, had made them so successful before, right. and they weren't willing or able to do that. So, so like that's why you have this ecological succession often as, right. as the environment changes. And uh, I just think that that, that sort of, ecological underpinning has been a big part of my thinking through my life. Maybe because I you know, read Dune and wrote a book about Frank Herbert <laughs> early in my life. But, right. um, uh, so I kind of, I use the term fitness function, which sometimes is called an objective function or a loss function. You know, it, it, but what I mean is simply that, that whether you are, you know, even though Google, for example, has hundreds of different factors there's only one thing that all those factors are pointing towards, which is relevance, right? right. And in, in Facebook's case, it's you know, social engagement. And in our financial markets, it used to be, I mean, and again, for a brief period, in this period of the economy that we look back on and say that was so, you know, where the good middle-class jobs, you know, that was because that's what we were telling the algorithms to optimize for. Right. And the reason for that was we had just come out of a period, you know, of the Great Depression with, you know, millions of people, you know, unemployed, uh, which led to huge political instability and a great world war. Right. And they went, oh, shit. Right. You know, and so Jobs they are important. Right. So they focused after World War II for you know, 20, 30 years on making sure that people had jobs, that they were well paid. And then starting in the 70s and 80s, we kind of went, ah, well, we don't really need to do that. It led, I mean, the way they had implemented it, I mean, to be fair, had led to some problems. We had massive inflation, remember. Right. And, uh, but the issue is, it's, it's as if, uh, you know, the spammers came to Google right. and they went, ah, forget search. Let's do something completely different. You know, as opposed to going, oh, we have to actually tune the algorithms. Right. So they basically did this complete pivot to uh, this idea that, of shareholder value, which is right. if you take care of the shareholders and align management's interests with the, the, the interests of the shareholders, uh, you, you'll actually make the economy more successful. And it turned out to be wrong. It turned, us it turned into out a, to be right for some period, though, right? Like, it, um, it, didn't it, like, uh, get people focused on growth and... It, it, you it's know, hard. It, 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 greed yes is good. Yeah, you yes know, driving and, people to be more innovative. I mean, that seems to I'm be not the really, capitalist counterargument. You know, there's there's definitely a. a uh, I'm sure there were cases where right. that uh, uh, was and is true, um, 
but it clearly went way too far because, it, you know, well, you see the, the, the long-term result. And I think I'm much more critical of that maybe than some, but increasingly you are starting to see, um, you know, uh, uh, economists more generally are starting to say, whoa, we, we, we took a wrong turn here. Uh, you know, and I think Piketty's book, uh, um, Capital in the 21st Century, kind of really made people realize that inequality is, is a very, very dangerous thing. Uh, started people talking and thinking about that. And I think we look around and we see that the system gets rigged. You know, and again, this is why the lessons of these big, super powerful companies Rather than saying we got a really good thing, let's keep it going. Right. You know, we have to actually make our platform a good thing for the participants. Instead, they, they're driven by the master algorithm, which is keep growing shareholder value. So Google says, even Google has to say, we, our profits have to keep going up. We have to keep growing. Right. And so, yeah, sorry, we're just going to have to eat Yelp. You know, right. oh, we're going to have to eat, uh, you know, uh, uh, all these new categories, all these categories that previously they were sending traffic to. Right, and it was like partnerships. And right. Google, Google's business was based upon having partners who put content in that they could index. That's Those right. partners allowed them with robots.txt to come yeah. index their information. And Google told them, listen, this is in your best interest. Let us index you. Here's ways for you to structure your data, yeah. structure your data this way so we can easily ingest it and make it easier for people to search. And we have an ad network. You can put our ads on your site and we'll give you the bulk of the revenue. We'll give you two thirds of the revenue if you put AdSense on your site. Yeah, and I then at some point they just flipped a switch and decided they would double cross all those partners. I think that's true. And it's, you see this tragedy repeated again and again. And it's not universal. For example, I think YouTube is still in the mode where they're, they're actually still building the ecosystem. Right. But I look at these companies and I wonder, why aren't you trying to optimize for the steady state solution and, and understanding better why you need a, an ecosystem of small companies, that, that you are, in fact, a platform mm. for other people? And um, if you take too much out of the platform... Uh, the whole the whole system falls down, and I I, I, th I see that writ large in our economy. And I'm just trying to make the argument from tech as opposed to from traditional economics. Right, and the polarization of wealth has been unbelievable. The, yeah. the one percent and the point oh one percent have gotten just unbelievably wealthy and powerful to a level that nobody ever imagined that somebody would have fifty billion dollars or sixty billion dollars. It's yeah. obscene. Well, and, and it's also I don't think people understand quite how that happens. And, and so this, again, you know, there's so many threads in the book because it's really, a, you know, the lifetime of thinking, you know, one of the things I've done a lot in my career is notice something that other people weren't noticing. Right. So for example, you know, early on uh, with the free software movement, I was like, why are you guys not talking about the internet? All you're talking about is Linux. You know, right. there's this whole other universe of, uh, and I go, oh, because you framed the discussion around a political agenda mm. and these people don't have your political agenda, so you leave them out of the narrative. Let's tell the narrative a little differently with everybody in it who's giving away their software for free and see wh wh how, how that story comes out differently. So uh, in a similar way, you know, I, I just trying to uh, understand what we can see and learn, which things are like each other here. Mm. And, and the fact that, that these lessons from platforms uh, have, have repeated three or four times in my you know, career. And, and, and I'm really trying to urge companies to understand better. You know, this is in your long-term interests. You know, it's I, in your long-term interest to what? Well, uh, to, to basically not extract too much value from the ecosystem. Right. You know, I mean, if you look at it across our world, you know, it's like, uh, how do you have sustainable farming practices? How do you have, uh, you know, sustain a sustainable world? It applies in business, too, and you can kind of see it. Mm. I still remember one time Walt Mossberg said to me, and I can't believe I didn't put this in the book. Uh, he said uh, he, he was reporting on a conversation he'd had with Steve Ballmer at Microsoft. And he said, Steve, you know, you'd only have to dial back the greed 5% for people to like you 100% more. You know, and it, it's just like you, you, Microsoft just pushed it so hard, you know, and, and, and they didn't have to. Oh, and they, the problem is, and what I came to, I think, as I, as I really developed the book, is there is this uh, force which is driving people, and it is our financial capitalism. People don't understand 
Um, you know, so I, I mentioned this idea of, of, of sort of when I talked about open source, I kind of, how do you draw a correct map of the world? Right. And one of the things that really struck me as interesting, when we say the market, you know, we're actually talking about two things. We're talking about the market as Adam Smith described it, which is, uh, or, or, or Ricardo, you know, people producing goods and services and exchanging them, and there's this magic, you know, invisible hand yep. where people are pursuing their own uh, advantage. Uh, comparative advantage means that people who are good at something, you know, and, and it's, it's magic, right. you know? And, and then there's financial capitalism, which is this additional layer, which is people betting on the outcome of the real market. Right. So when people say Uber is worth $68 billion, well, actually, let me back up a little bit and say, uh, you know, uh, uh, just bring it back to my personal career. Right. I started my company with 500 bucks. Right. And we're now a couple of hundred million dollars in revenue. And, you know, over four, you know it's taken 40 years to get there. Um, you know, long, slow growth, creating a lot of value for many other companies. You know, a lot of billionaires have told me, oh, yeah, I started my company with an O'Reilly book. Uh, it's great, right. you know. But um, I've always lived in this world where I sell some, something to somebody and they give me money. Right. And I live on the profits from that exchange. So I live in the Adam Smith economy. Right. But I'm competing with companies that don't live in the Adam Smith economy. They, they live in a world where you're getting money from, uh, you know, VCs, right. potentially, and maybe you don't have any profits at all. Right. You don't maybe have customers paying you at all. And eventually, maybe you get there, but maybe you don't. I mean, Twitter's still not profitable. Right. Um, uh, Twitter, Amazon, uh, too, right? I mean, Amazon well, spent 20 years. Yeah, they, they spent know. a long time, but yeah. they, they got there. And I think there's a real role for financial capital building out like hard things in the future. I think Jeff has used capitalism well, you know, financial markets. I think Elon has used them really well. Uh, but when you think about where the, the, this huge swing in the amount of money that a dollar of profit is worth to a private company, for me, a dollar is worth a dollar, hmm. right? And for uh, Jeff Bezos, a dollar is worth a couple of hundred dollars because basically a stock is this estimate of future profits, what right. people, are, you know, and there's this sort of price earnings ratio. Amazon's, I think, was 186 when I was writing the book. Yeah. I don't know what it is right now, probably even higher. Yeah. Uh, you know, Facebook's is about 50. You know, so basically Facebook gets a dollar of profit, they get $50 of market value. So they're playing with a currency that's worth 50 times as much yeah. as. And that's why you can do acquisitions. I had this experience where I was trying to buy a company and um, you know, we looked at its cash flow and profits because that's the world we live in. And right. we said, okay, yeah, and, and it's estimate you know, and our you know, reasonable estimate of its future cash flow and profits. And we said, oh, it's worth $13 million. And then a uh, competitor bought it for 40. Mm. You know, well, they're an IPO track company. They had already gotten valuations from VCs uh, of, five, of five times their actual, you know, yeah. uh, you so know five times the revenues. Yeah. They're doing the arbitrage. So they go, well, we'll pay three times what it's worth. That's cheaper than, uh, than we are, right? And the problem with that is, you know, you can have a company... You don't always know what the result is. You, you only know the result in the long term, but you have to assess it. You know, like are Uber and Lyft simply borrowing from the future with right. this inflated valuation? And the steady state end game will be that they will be a profitable, sustainable company. Or will they at some point flame out or will they at some point have to raise their prices or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a break the model? But meanwhile, they have this incredible currency where they can just swamp the market. Right. All right. When we get back, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the mapping you do in the book. We'll pull up a couple of graphs here about Southwest and Uber uh, and talk a little bit about that company because it seems like you've got a real obsession with Uber and Lyft's uh, marketplace. So when we get back... Well, uh, they're Uber, just great lessons from them. Yeah, yeah. When we get back on This Week in Startups. Ah, yes. Blue Apron. I have been enjoying my Blue Apron. We use it all the time in the Calacanis household. It's amazing. We get a box at the beginning of the week. We have two meals. It's enough to feed four or five people. And we get started. We make them both on Monday and Wednesday. And we have great nutritious food. 
right there, ready to go for our family. It's very flexible. Every week we get these custom recipes on beautiful recipe cards, and they take all the ingredients, and they put them in these cute little bottles and bags so there's no measuring, there's no mess. Everything is easy breezy, and it's guaranteed. Freshness guaranteed for every single ingredient, ready to cook, and they if not, they're going to just make it right. That's one of the great things about these brands. They rely on NPS scores, which is... Would you tell your friend about the service? So all they want to do is make you happy. When a company like Blue Apron wants to make you happy, magic happens. They will just give you the best produce, the best meats, the best fish. It's been incredible in our household. And I want you to go ahead and try to get your first three meals for free with shipping just by going to blueapron.com slash twist. Blueapron.com slash twist. That's right. Three meals free with free shipping. You're going to love how delicious it is. It feels great. It tastes great. And it's just incredible to make food at home for less than $10 a person, right? It's just less than $10 a person, and it's that easy. There's no commitment. You only get deliveries when you want them. But we've been getting it every week, and life has been easy breezy for us. We want to eat healthy. We don't want to break the bank. And we like variety. And there's so many different things. Actually, you know what we had the other day? They had this beautiful sourdough bread. I was like, where did this bread come from? And you know what I did? I sliced it up, and I toasted it. Oh, my God. The, I, you know, I'm not supposed to be eating bread, but I love it so much. And the hamburgers, oh, my God. We had beautiful hamburgers with those nice American, you know, like the classic American buns and a nice slice of cheddar cheese or American cheese. I can't remember which one it was. Beautiful hamburgers, beautiful tomatoes, beautiful lettuce. They're going farm to table, everything easy breezy, so easy. And, of course, it's affordable and you have that guarantee. They're going to make anything right if it's anything goes wrong, but I haven't had anything go wrong yet, including General Tso's chicken, which is one of my favorites from New York. I used to order the General Tso's all the time. I had no idea how it was made. They had all the little containers there. You whip it together, boom, General Tso's chicken in San Francisco. Loved it. Okay, go ahead and go to blueapron.com slash twist, blueapron.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest this week, Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media. You have his books. You've been to his conferences. And now go buy his book. Pre-order it, please. That's a great thing to do to support an author. Just go to Amazon, Audible, Barnes & Noble, iBooks, whichever format you choose, and pre-order the book so you're the first to get it. Uh, It's a great way to support authors and great work like WTF, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us, not What the... yeah. yeah. Well, a little play on words I, I there. I do play, uh, play on it. The point is, WTF can be an expression of astonishment and delight, or it can right. be an expression of astonishment and disgust. It's true. Right? And uh, I, I thought it was sort of appropriate because technology is bringing us so much astonishment, and it is also bringing us a lot of dismay. And the question is, do we get the WTF of astonishment or the WTF of dismay is... My point is, it's up to us, and what do we have to do differently to get more of one and less of the other? Hey, let me ask you a question. You you grew up uh, in the technology business, Mm -hmm. and it seemed like it was a lot of like hippie culture and like a lot of goodwill, and we're going to change the world in a good way. Mm -hmm. And you watched a lot of people with that kind of intentionality all of a sudden become worth billions of dollars. And do you feel like the dream is over of technology and the internet and the innocence is kind of lost now and it's just become a huge money grab? And is that like disappointing to you? Because you knew a lot of these people early on, they would come to food camps. Does the scale of the industry and the amount of money at stake, has it just changed and corrupted the whole vision of what the internet and technology could have been for society? No, I I guess I don't really believe that. I, I, I guess I believe that... Uh, there's a cycle to things, huh. and uh, industries grow up, mm. and they become less dynamic, and exciting things move elsewhere. You know that's the other lesson. And so the point is, as people get greedy, mm. they end up losing in the long run. Right. And so there they is too tight. Is that the Pardon me? They squeeze too tight? They squeeze too tight, but they also hang on. You know, it's like in the Microsoft days, they used to refer to it as the strategy tax. Right. You know, and I see the strategy tax all the time. What does it mean? Well, it was basically, well, that would be the right thing to do, but we, you know, it's, um, you know, our strategy is, you know, for example, the internet was the right thing to do for them long term. 
but their strategy was no, everything has to be Windows, right? They had a big internal debate and the strategy tax was no, you have to make it point to Windows. Now you look at this on Google. I just recently, I went through this nightmare, uh, you know, half hour, how do I get this video out of, uh, you know, Google Photos so I can actually successfully post it to Facebook because Google wants to send you a link right? because they want to bring you back to Google. That's a strategy tax. That's like, okay, we don't want to give you your own data e in an easy format. You, you know, like, yeah, you can, you know, when you download, you get an HTML file right. where the, the MP4 is sort of buried somewhere in there. And it's, it's like- It's interesting. You, you can't even get the stuff anymore. You can't. I, end, I ended up actually- Believe it or the not, inspection, inspecting the page. I, what I, I finally figured out to do was actually export it to YouTube, which is another of their own properties. And from YouTube, I could download it. <laughs> but, but out of Google Photos, no. And you kind of go, that is just broken thinking right. where they don't understand that actually serving the user mm. is more important than serving their, their strategy. Mm. You know, And, and I, I just feel like we... we uh, we see that across these products where they kind of go, yeah, that would be the right thing for the user, but yeah, we need it. Uh, How do you maintain your relationship being uh, a pundit? And you're pretty critical at times of certain companies. Mm -hmm. um, do you find you lose relationships over that kind of punditry and being honest about the state of things? Uh, or do you just, the chips fall where they may, you're going to be an independent critical thinker, and, and if people don't like it, too bad. Like right now you're criticizing, obviously, Google's yeah. thinking here. Does that impact the impact of Larry Page showing up for an event? Or No, I, I mean, well, let me put it this way. There's probably been a few times with some companies where I've said something where uh, they cut me off. I still <laughs> remember one in particular. Uh, this is on Twitter. I, I uh, uh, Michael Dell yeah, I, I actually never met Michael, and right. he has never been to any events or anything. But we were we were friendly back and forth on Twitter, and he would retweet me and stuff. And one time, he just went on some rant about taxes, right. you know, how taxes were too high and so on. And just on impulse, I went and checked how much tax Dell paid versus their you know major competitors. I went right. and looked at IBM and HP and yeah. all, all other PC companies, and found that you know Dell's average effective tax rate was twelve percent, and HP was paying thirty percent. Mm. And I said. Uh, uh, Michael, you know, yeah. you, you're whinging about how high your taxes are, but you're paying a third of what all your competitors are paying. You know, it's like, yeah. what's with this? And, <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, I linked to the various, and, and I never heard from him again. You know? um, Burn that bridge. <laughs> you know, uh, you're and, messing with people's paper. You got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, the point, point was that, that uh, you know, you've got to be honest. I mean, you look at someone like, well, yourself or yeah. Kara Swisher or, or right. you know, you kind of speak truth to power and that's part of what you do. And sometimes people get mad at you. But, yeah. but I also, you know, again, I love these companies and I, you know, I think most of them know that I'm trying to give them useful advice. And I also try whenever, when I have something really critical to say, to make sure I give it privately first. Ah, well, you know, so I'll send an email saying, hey, you know, I noticed this thing. And then it's like, you know, it's like if you think back, my, my most famous one of those was uh, in 2000 when I ran the one-click patent protest against Amazon. Right. And I started by sending Jeff an email saying, hey, I, you know, this is a problem. Here's why, you know, Richard Stallman wants me to you know, run a boycott. And I'm, I don't think we should do that. I just think you should change your policy. <laughs> and, right. you know, and, uh, you know, I, then I escalated to an open letter. And then Jeff and I talked about it. And they kind of changed their position a little bit. And, yeah, one they were uh, basically their position was one click buying was yeah. their innovation. Yeah, that's right. When in fact there were plenty of examples of no, one. No, actually, this is really interesting, and I do talk about it in the book. Uh, we tend to rewrite the past. Right. Uh, it turns out Jeff and I actually we funded a company called Bounty Quest, which was an early crowdsourcing uh, company for uh, patent prior art, and we we put up a bounty and we didn't find anything. Huh. And uh, you know the point is that often something seems obvious in retrospect, ah. and we see this really with. Um, so they really were on the internet, the one-click innovators. Yeah, the, we Not really like there really was nothing like it, hmm. uh, and, and it's you, you, afterwards you go, oh yeah, that's totally obvious. But and it was totally obvious as soon as somebody did it. Right. Uh, but you see the same thing in national security. It's like why, you know. You know, after the 9/11, for example, there was all this analysis of all the stories of, of you know, well, somebody had reported these, you know, people going to flight right. school and yeah. you know, so really buying one way tickets. Flight school, they don't want to know how to land. Yeah, that's they right. They just want to know how to take off and fly the plane. That's right. You I mean, know, and, and really so don't some, care about landing. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. But the fact was, 
that was a needle in the haystack at the yeah. time, right. you know? And yeah, it's obvious once, you know, what happened, but it, it, it wasn't, you know, it was sort of unthinkable. And so in some ways, actually, there's a whole chapter in the book about one of the jobs of the entrepreneur is to think the unthinkable. You know, we had, it's kind of coming back around to, to Uber, uh, you know, we had connected taxi cabs, you know? A and, times, yeah. And, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we, we, it was like, let's put a, a credit card reader in the back and a little TV screen so we can show ads, you know? Right. And, uh, and there were a few companies like Cabulous and so on that were actually trying to, um, uh, you know, build a, a truly connected taxi cab, but they were trying to work within the confines of the way cab drivers work. So it was this yeah. add-on and it didn't really take off. And it wasn't until, you know, uh, uh, Garrett and Travis kind of figured out, first of all, they worked with the black cars. That was just a luck. That was luck. Right. You know, that was where they, these guys started the business. And, and that was actually a better market for this to take off and matching up these high end dr drivers with high end passengers. And they did that for a few years. Meanwhile, Sunil Paul had actually uh, um, written patents back in 2000, uh, you know, seven or eight years earlier about all the things you could do with smartphones, but he had actually not done it because there weren't enough smartphones around. <laughs> and then after Uber came out, he, he started up, um, uh, and uh, what was the name of his company? Anyway, it went belly up because right. he, he didn't raise enough capital, um, which is too bad. But Lyft kind of got the idea of watching him, and they did the, the sort of the, the crowdsourced uh, version. Yeah, you bring the car, you don't need a medallion. You bring the car, you don't need, you know, and, and, and then Uber picked that up a year later. Right sharing it. So, so, so it was all these innovations that kind of come together. Uh, I do and, like and, to map these things out. Let's pull up this map here. I thought this was one of the fascinating yeah. parts of the book that's pretty applicable to startups, which is yeah. here we're looking at a map of Southwest, a low fare airline. Yeah. Uh, let me explain exp to us what this chart is for people who are listening as well. Yeah. Uh, first off, um, one of the chapters I, I, I described this uh, approach of, of mapping out a business model, uh, which uh, I'd worked with some consultants, uh, Dan and Meredith Beam, back in 2000, and they worked with companies on their business model, which they described as the way that all of the parts of the business work together to create marketplace advantage and customer value. Hmm. And so they use Southwest as an example, and this is actually their chart, and it was based on some work done by Michael Porter. Uh, but you know, you know that Southwest, if you've ever flown it, they don't do things like other Very airlines. Different. Different. You know, so if you if you talk in generalities, you say, well, you know, an airline just like anyone else, but you go, no, when you actually understand they have limited passenger service, you know, uh, with short haul point to point routes, uh, they 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 try to keep their their uh, ticket price is low. They have high aircraft utilization, frequent reliable departures, but there's no connections between uh, other airlines. There's no baggage transfers. There's no meals. There's no seat assignments. So they actually figured out all these things that work together to make this business model work. And for many years, they were the only profitable airline before uh, basically the other airlines figured out a different business model, which was charge lots of fees for things like luggage and, and, and amenities, reduce service, and charge fees to, to get decent service. Right. Uh, you know, which is is obviously a very very different business model. And uh, but that led me to understand in my own business, you know, that we were at the time mostly a book publisher who was also doing some conferences. But we started saying, well, actually, you know, our our fundamental business is connecting this great pool of talent who knows something that other people want to know. And yes, we can do that through books, but we could also do it through conferences. We launched a venture firm. Uh, we uh, you know, built our online learning platform, Safari, because we realized there were lots of different ways to do that and, and people could feed from one to the other. So I, I, I took this and I used the same approach to sort of map out what I thought was the business model of Uber and Lyft. Now this, you know, they may not agree with, with this, but let's, let's flip to that yeah. uh, slide. So if you think about, um, you know, Uber and Lyft, what's the first thing that people experience? And, and, you know, kind of, if you can kind of roll back your mind to 2008, 2009, when you first, um, you know, or whenever you first heard of the service, how magical it was. It was incredible. That, that, People were blown away that you could actually get a cab, a ride for that price. 
right. with that certainty. That's right. The certainty, the fact that you know this car would just show up for you, it was and magical. you know how many minutes it was, and so so there was that magical user experience. But you said, what did it actually require? When you think about all the parts of the business model working together, mm. uh, they have had to build a critical mass of drivers. Yep, and a critical mass of passengers, and so a big part of their expense, of course, has been. Um, uh, actually building the matching marketplace. Yep. A, a matching, an algorithmic matching marketplace is the heart of what they do. And so, um, you know, and yes, they're, they're, they are, there's a broader question in our society. One of the things they're doing is replacing ownership with access, and they're convincing people to take that new approach. Which there, is, you don't need to own a car. Right, that's right. we're guaranteeing you a ride in as few as one, two, three minutes. Low single digits. That's right. I call it an uno yeah. When you get it in one minute. That's right. It's, it's fantastic. Uber Uno. Yeah. And, and, and they're a platform. Right. So again, this, this sort of notion that these are that these are the digital platforms that are enabling real world services now. But there's another critical piece that I identified here and that I, I, I kind of trying to generalize this and say, what do we learn from this about the future of the economy? And one of them is that they actually augment their workers. Mm. You don't think about it uh, that way, but, you know, because augmented sounds like augmented reality. Right. But, you know, if you compare an Uber or Lyft driver to a taxi cab driver, you know, they don't have this magic sixth sense, the taxi driver, that says, go two blocks over, there's a passenger over there. Right. They just drive around aimlessly looking for right. people, or they drive up and down the streets where people are most likely to be. Meanwhile, passengers don't have this magic sixth sense, you yeah. know, going, well, there's actually a cab next block over, yeah. you know. In New uh, York, we had an idea which avenues would do better, like the yeah, avenues sure. that move fast. Oh, but it was ab- always ab- this weird, yeah. like something you learned after 10, 20 years in the city. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and the critical mass of drivers is possible also because of the augmentation provided by Google Maps. Yep. You know, it used to be a driver had to actually know his or her way around. Yeah, the test, that was the test and the training. That's right. It was, it was hard. And, you know, somebody says, I want to go to such and such. And you, know, you think about, the, there's still this test in London, the, the, the knowledge yeah. of, the, of the streets and monuments of London. And you literally have to be a, it's almost like a Frank Herbert style mentat, yeah. able to, re, you know, they literally say, how would you get to such and such from such and such? And you do a turn by turn, you recite the turn by turn right. uh, to get to some obscure street in London from some other obscure street in London. You know, astonishing feats of memory required uh, to pass that test. And now anybody can do it. And that's part of the secret of the business model. And the reason I want to uh, talk this through is because it teaches you something about how this kind of analysis of a business model can be used to understand the strengths and weaknesses of a startup. So, for example, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the media about how self-driving cars will make Uh, Uber and Lyft much more profitable. And you'll read analysis that reads something like this. You know, uh, well, once you have self-driving cars, they won't have to pay the percentage to the drivers. They save Uh, that 25%. The 75% they give to drivers. Right. Right. But, well, save in quotes. Uh, uh, And not only that, they said, and this is one story I'm thinking of in Fortune, not only that, the cars can be utilized all the time. Right. And, you know, if you actually think about it a little bit, the the essence of the on-demand model is that the two sides of the marketplace scale in tandem. Right. Right? You don't actually, the reason why taxi cabs don't work that well is because they kind of go, well, on average, the peak is about this. We need enough cars to handle uh, some percentage of peak. If we have too many cars, they're going to be sitting around idle. Right. Right. And the beauty of people showing up with their own cars using this swarming marketplace model is you're always optimizing for three-minute pickup time. Hmm. You know, not a lot of car, uh, passengers, not a lot of cars. Uh, you know, a lot of passengers, a lot of cars. So all of a sudden you go with self-driving cars, you're going to have to have enough cars for peak hmm. all of a sudden. You're going to have to have, you know, if you're owning them all. Yeah. And so that led me down the path in that analysis saying, okay, so what's really going to happen with self-driving cars and Uber and Lyft is one of two things. Uh, they're either going to have to figure out uh, a bunch of very, very hard math about how they're going to keep incentivizing human drivers uh, to be part of the mix. Mm. And, you know, again, they're clearly thinking of this. They're going to have to balance the, the self-driving cars. But the other option 
is, oh, we shouldn't be building and owning our own fleet. We should be pushing for interoperability in self-driving cars and enabling hooks in our platform so that anybody with a self-driving car can provide it a la Airbnb through our platform. Right. Because then they don't have to own the cars and they maintain the scalability of the on-demand model. That's why Tesla is not allowing their cars to be used by it, any other network. Exactly. They, when you buy self-driving, you have to sign off right. the rights but, that you'll only share it with Tesla's but network. I think that that's short-sighted thinking on the point of Tesla because, again, l they have to look at that and kind of go, will there be enough Teslas to create a, 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 a truly viable network? You know, the fact is, if, if you, know, you don't have enough cars to produce that three-minute ride time, Do we you're, need kind, millions of, of cars? you're kind of screwed. You, you need millions of cars right. and, in, in different places. And, you know, so I don't see how Tesla can possibly succeed with that Mm. Uh, because they don't not going to have the scale, so they're eventually going to have to end up becoming part of somebody's network. But the point is, I don't think that people are, are actually thinking through what the real business model is and right. what the leverage in the business model is clearly enough uh, to to work out that balance. Mm. And so, you know, point is, this is true across businesses. You know, uh, you know, as I said, like if you you, you think about. Uh, uh, you know, the, the fundamental balancing act that a platform like Google or Facebook or Amazon has to, you know, think about or, or these, these platforms, you know, if it, you have to say, is it good for all of the participants in the marketplace? You know, if you put in too many ads and people go away, yeah, you're pleasing your advertisers up to a point. Right. And then the users leave and uh, the advertisers aren't happy and the thing falls down. You can kind of see that it has to be in balance. You can't take too much. Mm. Uh, if you, uh, you know, are, have your platform makes too many onerous demands on the users or doesn't let them do things that they want, they go, well, you know, I mean, I think of some of the things, I've been on Android for years and I go, maybe I should try an iPhone because I was so sick and tired of, of what just happened with, uh, uh, you know, this Google Photos thing. And at the same time, I go, Probably I find the same kind of Roach Motel on the Apple side because none of these companies are putting their users first. <laughs> you know? All right, let's do a quick break. And then when we get back, I want to talk about um, the future of work and if uh, society is going to go into a cataclysmic job apocalypse or if there's any way for us to recover. Okay. Uh, when, when we get back on this, we can start us. Hey, everybody. Let me tell you about one of our new partners here at This Week in Startups. It's ShipStation. Now, I got to be very delicate when I say this. ShipStation.com. S-H-I-P, Station.com. It's the number one choice of online sellers. So, if you're selling online, you know that getting orders out the door quickly is hard. That's why you need ShipStation.com. It's fast and easy to manage and ship your orders all from one place. You want to keep those customers happy. So whether you're using Shopify, Squarespace, Etsy, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, or any of the other popular sh selling channels, you should be using ShipStation. And it brings all of your orders into one simple interface. It's easy to manage from any device, including your mobile phone when you're on the go. It brings all of those orders into one interface so that you can use shipping labels from all the top carriers, UPS, FedEx, the U.S. Postal Service, they do a nice job over there as well. And you can ship more in less time at the best rates available. So let's get to the call to action here. This is important for all of you in commerce land. I want you to try ShipStation for free for 30 days. And know that you're going to get that second month free if you use the promo code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T. So go to ShipStation.com before you do anything else. And click on that microphone at the top of the homepage and type in TWIST, T-W-I-S-T. Ship station. Make ship happen. Thanks again for joining the This Week in Startups family. It's great to have a new partner here. And uh, ShipStation.com does a great job. Remember to use that promo code TWIST and give them a little bit of love. Go ahead and uh, try the product. You're going to love it, especially all you e-commerce people out there who have these packages to ship. Commerce is becoming such a huge business, and all these great companies are coming along to support it, including ShipStation.com. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. 
Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Very special episode with Tim O'Reilly. Right before his new book is coming out, I want you to go pre-order it right now. Super important to support authors when uh, they're in this window. So go to Amazon or Audible or Barnes & Noble or iBooks or wherever you want to buy your book and pre-order it and order WTF. What's the future and why it's up to us, Tim O'Reilly. I notice in the book you're not super... Um, you balance being super negative and super positive. There are things on the surface that ex look extremely challenging for society. The polariz polarization of wealth has been one. We both reference in our books, actually, <laughs> Operation Wall Street, which is something that I just looked at and said, wow, that is the future. Like, if we hit another moment of 20% unemployment, 30% unemployment, we're going to have riots in the street. It's so clear to me. And they didn't stop in Oakland and, you know, they stopped in New York. But that, to me, seems the dry run for something bigger that's about to happen, which is 30 million truck driving, cab driving jobs and retail jobs are some percentage of those are going away. What percentage in America? And obviously we're talking as Americans here from a very American centric point of view. But it's pretty clear to me that some large percentage of those 30 million retail and driving jobs will go away in the next 20 years, 10, 20 years. How bad is job compression going to be, and how do we deal with it? Well, uh, to me, the it's up to us is the, the central part of my message. Because if you actually think about what we should be optimizing for with business, it's not how much money can we extract. You know, one of my Wait, most— what? <laughs> well, you know, seriously, uh, one of my uh, most often, uh, you know, sort of meme— uh, meme uh, framed sayings that I see on, on Twitter all the time is at the time I said, look, uh, money in a business is like gas in your car. Yeah. Uh, you're not taking a tour of gas stations. Right. You know, you're trying to go somewhere. Right. And great companies have a mission. You know, and it's pretty easy to see this with Elon Musk, right? right. He's a super successful businessman because he wants to make something happen. You look at Google, they have this mission. You look at Mark, he has this mission. And yes, they're really good at, uh, at, at they found this sweet business, they can make a lot of money, but they, that's not why they're doing it. You know, that when they started out, uh, they were just trying to do it. You know I mean? <laughs> Particularly, you know, some people definitely more, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurially driven and some of them fell into it. But at the end of the day, where are you going? And so when I think about at the world uh, and this potential future of unemployment, of mass unemployment, I go, well, that's an absolute failure of imagination. Look back at the Luddite Rebellion of 1811, 1812. Uh, you know, these, these weavers were being put out of work. But what actually happened over time, unfortunately over time, and uh, uh, was that we actually wore a lot more clothes. Mm. We bought more blankets and sheets. Uh, you know, we basically, you know, it's like we didn't say, oh, great, we managed to produce y your one suit of homespun without any labor. We're done. Right. You know, it's like all of a sudden ordinary people were, were having lots and lots of clothes. It induced we in, we, commerce. It induced commerce. Right. And, and I don't see why that will change. Mm. And, and there's two reasons or three reasons why I don't think it will change. The first one is that there are plenty of problems still to be solved. And I love my friend Nick Hanauer's quote. He said, look, technology is the solution to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. Right. You know, are we done yet? And you look at something like climate change alone, or even think about just it, self-driving cars. It's gonna lead to this enormous rebuilding of our society if we let it. Right. Because we're going to have to rethink the roads. We're going to have to rethink parking. We're going to have to rethink buildings. We're going to rethink the way people live, where they live. You know, all of these things create economic activity if we're actually solving real problems. Mm -hmm. uh, second reason is that, uh, and this is a thread that's run through my, you know, thinking since, uh, you know, I was first looking at open source versus proprietary software. Because there were a lot of people who were saying, oh, my God. The open source software is destroying proprietary software. And I said, no, no, actually something else is going to become valuable. Turned out Clay Christensen had, had called this the law of conservation of attractive profits. When one thing becomes a commodity, something adjacent usually becomes valuable. And in an open and source, that was That was services. data. It was, it was big data. Big you know, data. I, so that was where I, I, that led me to, well, what's actually going to become valuable is data. And that's kind of, I went down through Web 2.0 to big data, and, and that became kind of the, the narrative that my company followed in terms of of our events and so on. Um, 
and kind of teaching people that that was actually the new locus of competitive advantage because something else becomes valuable. And so when you think about, you know, um, our economy, whenever something is a commodity, Hmm. people find ways to make it valuable. Now, I'll give you a great example. Uh, Alexis Madrigal has this fabulous uh, uh, podcast about container shipping. And episode four, it's an eight eight, uh, podcast series. Episode four is about coffee. Hmm. And you think about the evolution of coffee. When I was a kid, coffee came in a five pound can of ground coffee, right? Yep. Hills Brothers or, uh, super you know. Super cheap. Yeah, whatever. A couple super, bucks a pound. That's right. And then we had the second wave of coffee, which was mass produced specialty coffee, you know, the Starbucks era. Hmm. And now, you know, you literally are buying coffee that's from a particular plantation in a particular country. Single uh, origin. Know, yeah, single origin with a particular roast, and it's coming from a particular roaster. It's much right. more like the wine market, right? Yeah. And people are paying way more for it. And, uh, What's really interesting in the container podcast is also just understanding how, in some ways, that has undone the labor savings of containerization Mm. because now they have to unpack the containers in a very different way, you know, because it's not going all in bulk. And so you're actually bringing labor back into the economy along with those higher prices because people are differentiating, you know. And so the thing that's interesting there is uh, we have to understand that. Uh, I, I kind of call it the creative economy writ large. You know, we think of creative economy as music, it's movies, it's books. The creative economy is wherever we add value with aesthetics, with, you know, with words, effectively. We're mixing in words. You know, yeah. this isn't just, uh, you know... Uh, coffee, it's single origin. It's single origin coffee. This yeah. isn't just, you know... Uh, fried chicken. It's church's fried chicken versus KFC. You know, it's yeah. like this, this This isn't just pizza. Water is deep- probably the best example I was just yeah, thinking. Yeah, like, yeah. I was in Hawaii and they brought Fiji water to the table. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, this yeah. is an interesting moment. There's a big bottle of water. I mean, it's perfectly good water on Hawaii. I'm sure there's plenty of natural springs, yeah, but yeah. They're, they're shipping water from Exactly. Another island to this island. This makes no sense. Absolutely. What are we doing? Well, be, be, <laughs> because what people are buying right. is the idea. The idea that and, and Fiji so water I, is I better than Hawaiian there's water. There's that whole ability <laughs> to, 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 to sell ideas, and, and that creative economy yeah. writ large is the second reason. And the third reason is that there's a huge amount of work that, uh, that needs doing that we don't pay for. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been fascinated Wait, all my life. Wait, this work we don't pay for? Yeah. To explain. Uh, raising children. Ah. Taking care of elders. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot Those of Those are new potential jobs. They're, they're new potential jobs. And in fact, healthcare is, in fact, the, grow, the fastest growing segment uh, uh, of the economy. And, and teaching, you know, I mean, these are all things that we've tended to undervalue. Mm. And we somehow seem to think that that's just natural. That's just the market. Right. No, it isn't just the market. You know, right. we, we actually... Uh, we control the market. Like, we, can, we, yeah, we have the right. sense that we're... I think one of the takeaways I have from your book is just because there is this market and just because the market has gone in this direction and the incentives have been, you know, developed perversely or, you know, to accelerate things in a way that is um, impressive but dangerous, we can change those. We right. can change those incentives. We can select the incentives we want. Well, and the, and the other thing is just understanding that the, the palette of ways that we pay for things uh, or change the, the dynamics of the labor market are very different than people expect. You know, if you think about what's happened over the last, uh, you know, 100 years, we vastly reduced working hours, right? Uh, that's that's a, 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 a reduction in one direction. We went down from 70 hours to, you know, 40. 35. 35, 40, 40. right? Uh, 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 in in places like Europe, it's gone even lower because yep. they uh, they didn't do it by saying, well, the work week is now thirty. They did it by saying, well, you get more time off. Yes, right. So the amount the amount of time that goes off paternity. made paternity leave. They, these are all hacks in some sense to to reduce the amount of labor that's available for the same amount of money. Right. Uh, we took children on the other side. We took children out of the workforce. Right. You know, at first with Thank with God. grade school children, and then with high school children. Yeah. And, and now with college kids coming home. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, the, the, but there really isn't. <laughs> interesting question it's like what if we said no actually we're going to 
pay for people to learn new skills. Right. You know, or, uh, you know, you are, you know, the work week has been reduced, but you're expected to spend time in public service, you right. know, or, um, you know, we've extended the amount of, uh, of leave that you're able to have to, to take care of aging parents. Those are ways effectively that we would be paying for this currently unpaid work. Yeah, and we could and, quadruple the number of teachers, quadruple right. the number of the healthcare providers, and, and we and, just mean slightly more taxes, but that's not right. a lot. That's right, not a lot. And the point is that I think there's a, this is where there's this failed narrative that making sure that the companies and the Wall Street financiers uh, make enough money mm. will take care of the rest of us just isn't true. No, uh, because actually, yeah. If, if, yeah, that's right. If you give money to ordinary people, they spend it. Right. You know, and, and so... It, you want to find the right balance. Clearly, you have to have, you know, uh, corporate invest, investment, and you have to have incentives. But I look back at the people who built Silicon Valley, and I go, you know, if people, if you looked at some, some, there's probably many a, uh, you know, current tech billionaire who's worth more than you know Andy Grove or. Um, Gordon Moore ever were, you know, or, or Hewlett and Packard. You know, right. it's just like the industry has become so rich, and we don't quite understand it. Wall Street, so rich, twenty five percent of all corporate profits with four percent of employment. You know, these guys are just sucking the lifeblood out of the economy. Right. And if they were, you know, again, it's partly. I don't think it's just more taxes. I do think that a higher, you know, higher tax. It's a really different tax system. I think would be really important mm -hmm. because if you think about, you know, a lot of the financial games, uh, they actually have the lowest tax rate. Yeah, they should have the case. highest tax rate. You know, it's like front running, you know, uh, the market and, and, and skimming the cream, right. and, you know, should be taxed at a very high rate. Yeah. Uh, but even capital gains in general, the difference between somebody who starts a business and works at it for, you know, 30, 40 years and then sells it uh, is treated the same as somebody buying a stock and holding it for a year. Right, it's completely and, different. And in completely different, you know, kettle of fish. And we don't actually call, the, we call them the same thing, you know. And not only that, you see, I've been thinking a lot about this in the, in the realm of stock buybacks, which are in theory a, a good idea. You know, it's like a company has too much cash, give it back to the shareholders. Yeah. Or, or if, your stock, the of shares. if your stock is undervalued, reduce the number of shares. Sure. Uh, but it's really used as a kind of fake news to the market. Right. And so I, I really was very mindful of this recently because Jeff Immelt, uh, who I, I think, first of all, just I have this vivid memory. I was sitting next to him at his Mind and Machines event, and he's looking up at the people on the stage, and I felt like I was at a school play where the par with a parent who was looking on with such love and pride. Huh. Uh, what was at, this event? Uh, it was about uh, GE's Minds and Machine event about their, you know, their transformation and their Predicts platform and so on. And I thought, this guy loves his company. Mm. You know, he'd been the CEO. And, and so the, I don't buy this idea that he, oh, yeah, he was planning to retire. He was forced out, you know, and I read the Tryon Partners uh, white paper from 2015 when they bought their stake in GE and did a bunch of analysis on it. And it's really striking because they describe how, in every respect, GE is a superior business to its competitors, except for its stock price, which has mm. stagnated. Now, of course, the stock price stagnated because uh, um, Jack Welch, Jeff's predecessor, did all kinds of stock market games, and it was at sort of this super high level. Right. And, uh, you know, it kind of came back down. And, little, and, yeah, there was a lot of stuff they had to do. But here's the answer that these guys came up with. GE should borrow an additional $20 billion. First of all, they should spin off a bunch of things. And, you know, some of that might have been rationalization of the business, and that's good, and give the money back to shareholders. But not only that – they should borrow $20 billion more and do even more buybacks. I go, what problem is that solving for GE? It, no problem. They no, didn't need, they didn't the, need the money. The stock go higher because there's less That's right. It, all available. it does is basically load the company with debt. And this is across our economy. You know, yeah. where, and you look it's at people like- the tactic of private equity. Is that's right. Buy a company, load it with debt, and then get out. That's right. And, and this is actually looting. And I, to me, you look at that and you kind of go, I'm not sure what the exact policy would need to be, but that kind of looting behavior, tax the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah so the, the notion that the only options are raise tax rates for everybody, mm -hmm. it's like closed loopholes, you know, raise tax rates on pernicious, you know, activities. You know, it's just like, come on. I, I always think about uh, this- uh, 
interaction I had with Nancy Pelosi, I put it in the book, uh, where I was sort of explaining, it was about piracy. And we're talking about why I didn't think piracy was a problem. I'm a publisher, and I, you know, it's like, and Pat and O'Reilly books are pirated. Yeah, they're they're heavily pirated. But I've always sort of believed if you're if you're lucky enough for people to care, uh, you know, some piracy is is a tax. I said I wrote a piece in 2002 called "Piracy is Progressive Taxation." So I'm explaining this to her, and. I was expecting her to say, show me your data. You know, this is really interesting that, you know, somebody who's a publisher would have this opinion. And she said, well, you know, we have to balance the interests of the tech industry in Hollywood. And I thought, that's not your job to balance the interests of, you know, it's about the balance of the interests of the, of the American people is what you right. should be about. And we really, when, when we- she says that, she's talking about the balancing her ability to raise funds from those That's people. exactly right. And yeah. we have to get away from that. So- Public financing of elections, you know, is probably the single most important thing to fix our, you know, our system because then you could start to have policymakers who actually are serving the people rather than serving their donors because the donors are continuing to, to line their pockets. And I, anyway, I, I think it's fixable, but it, we have to get away from the simple, you know, this simple narrative that well, it just would mean raising taxes on everybody. No, it's like raise taxes on in a very targeted way on things that are, uh, are, are basically hostile. And I kind of imagined, as I said, when I had that conversation with, with, uh, uh, Pelosi. Uh, with Pelosi, uh, of um, Google sitting down with spammers right. and kind of going, well, we'll give you three of the, you know, the top 10 spots, yeah. you know, because we, yeah, we, we want to balance it out. We got to balance it out. Well, it's the like, New York no. Times being like, we're going to just put three lies from the right that's like, right. You know, in this article, you know, your, we'll job as a, your job as a yeah. platform owner is to, is to make this thing work. Anyway, so we're, we're so, I want to talk a little bit about your book, oh. too. <laughs> I don't know if we you have, read before it. we run out of time. I did. Thank you. And I liked it a lot. Oh, um, that's nice. And I just wanted to encourage people, since we're, we're here touting my book also, yep. uh, uh, Jason's book, uh, Angel, yep. uh, which is already out. Already and out. so you don't have to pre-order it. You can just <laughs> order it and get a, get a copy. Um, First of all, really interesting because it's a view into the, in some ways, the Silicon Valley end of uh, this financial economy. And, you know, Jason, you kind of look at the startup game th uh, through the lens of being a, a you know, high stakes poker player. Yeah. And in some ways, uh, that's. Uh, different than your worldview. Yeah, yeah, different from my <laughs> worldview. But there's also, uh, in the middle of the book, there's two chapters about the questions to yeah. ask people when you're uh, evaluating entrepreneurs sure. that are just gold. Oh, and um, I thought they were r really interesting because, uh, you know, one of the other things that you learn as a poker player is that you're actually evaluating the people right. Uh, more than you're evaluating their hand. Yeah, the cards are secondary. Yeah, and, and I thought it was just very insightful and, uh, uh, you know, should be on every, uh, certainly if you're trying to raise money, understanding how investors think. Uh, this is a great uh, uh, book to start with. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people who are reading and are entrepreneurs. And I, I encourage people not to try to game investors. Like, there's a little bit of gamesmanship going on. I feel like people are trying to level each other a bit. Like, what does an investor want to hear? And it's it's usually that you care deeply about this business yeah, and that you have the skill to build it and the motivation to build it, right? Well, and that you understand yeah. it too. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, this idea of, of companies trying to please their investors is going to be the death of Silicon Valley. Oh my God, for sure. Uh, because ultimately, you want to build a sustainable business. And I think that if I have one serious criticism of today's Silicon Valley is uh, it's so focused on the exit. Right. And, you know, it used to be that the goal was to build a company that would last, that would yeah. go public. IPO. And, and now it's like, you know, can we you know, sell this. And, and a lot of times that's not that dissimilar from what was happening on Wall Street in 2006, 2007, 2008. Can we find some sucker to buy this thing? Yeah. And it doesn't Let's matter whether it's more, any more good. Bitches. It's just, can we tell a good story? <laughs> right. And, you know, if you're not thinking, and it's really true, I guess, in, in the same thing with stock buybacks, the whole notion of uh, sort of agency theory that came behind shareholder value was based on the idea of the continuing shareholder. Right. Right. But if you're going to basically pop the stock and exit, that whole theory falls apart. Right. You know, and so we actually have to think as a 
as a platform owner, as an entrepreneur, as a society, what does it mean to be a continuing shareholder in right. this thing? We're going to keep owning it. We want to take care of it. Yeah, I call it stakeholders. Yeah, stakeholders. It, you sure. know, just expanding beyond just the share. But, you know, when you think about Uber as an example, you know, you have so many stakeholders there, including the drivers, including the right. passengers. There are people who need Uber to get to work. They need it because they live out in the boroughs and they can't get a yeah. cab. I mean, it, it really has impacted their life, especially the low prices. That's one thing you talk about with the algorithm. I think you're a little critical of Uber's, um, I guess, maybe in your mind, over-optimization of the algorithm. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, it, it, more of the point that I was making in, in the book is that uh, in the same way that Google has satisfied, has used many, many different factors to improve mm. their algorithms, yeah. that Uber will need to take more factors into account than simply optimizing for passenger pickup time. Right. And they've kind of done a lot of hacks to kind of keep the supply of drivers. And I think, you know, one of the things that I called in the book, you know, quite correctly, unfortunately, the book was written, you know, finished uh, back in yep. February, won't be out till October because uh, uh, New York publishers are somewhat slow. Uh, 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 you know, if I had published it, I would have been... Uh, 30 days, I, 60 yeah, days? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, you know, I'm trying to reach an audience that's not the audience I already have, so right. I, I'm really glad with the trade-off and it's been great working with them. But uh, the point that I would make is that um, Uber, you know, and Lyft have to actually have a critical mass of drivers. And Uber, uh, 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 you know, just has been so driver hostile in some ways that I, I thought it would catch up with them eventually. And yeah. I, I think I called that. I said, look, you know, Lyft is really, because they are more, they are more mission-driven company and they are more focused on making it better for drivers, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to pan out uh, it's going to give them an advantage in the long run. Yeah, I think it's something that's not lost on Uber. You saw they added tipping and the yeah. ability to give compliments yeah. that go directly there. So I think that's something where they were playing the video game of just how do we have the marketplace be wickedly efficient and to the detriment of how do we keep the drivers happy and make them feel like they're part of this. That's right. right? And so I think although tipping does pervert a bit of the – equilibrium in a marketplace because some people tip, some people don't, and it's, you know, well, it's it, variable. It it's just something that's charming and has been part of society. So to go against it when Lyft has it, to me, seems like it's well, the other, the a other hard choice to make. interesting uh, on that one is I always thought they didn't do it partly because it it took away from that magical user experience of right, just that getting was the out reason. of the car. Cognitive overload. So it's this extra step they have yeah. to go through. But I, I've urge both companies and I don't you know they just neither is prioritized to go it'd be very easy for me to set that as a preference I would think you, you know would kind think, of, right just say yeah, give a just dollar say, every time my, my, yeah like we're 10% yeah it's like yeah whatever figure out a, a rate and we're going to have a default right. again this is something that goes back to the very early understanding of what works in uh, come set defaults that are the behavior defaults that matter. you want. <laughs> defaults really matter. Yeah. You know, it's like if you think People back. People seem to have lost that. That was sort of back in the early days of Web 2.0 where it was like, you know, open by default, you know, it leads to scale, you right. know, versus making, you know, permissionless was why the web worked. You know, it's like we understood that. Creative you know? by default. Yeah. And so, you know, same thing. You could go tipping by default. You can turn it off if you want. Yep. Um, and, and that's fine. Or you could say, I want my tip to scale with the number of stars that I give. And that might make the stars more honest. Yeah, that would be, yeah, even you know, and, more and, more um, and, and of course, that might mean they'd have to have their algorithm be a little less punitive for people who, you know, because, hey, people might go, yeah, actually, I don't really want a tip, so I'm going to give it three stars because yeah. that's the, it, it scales according, you know, it's like, you know, there's all kinds of experiments, A-B testing. Come on, this is what you guys are good at. Right. You know, and yeah. uh, let's try it. Yeah, I think they, the, my take on it, as, and listen, I'm an investor, so I'm, I'm a little bit close to it, but it feels like they were so good at fighting to get into every city yeah. that the video game became how fast can we grow, how many cities, what percentage of the market, how many rides, and they just were riding the metrics up. And so in a way, if you think about Zuckerberg and what happened at Facebook or Google, as the numbers go up, kind of people forgive whatever happens on the edges until they don't, that's right? right? And I, I think that's one thing that's a, a big takeaway from what happened with Uber 
and even with Facebook to a certain extent, because they, they were a little out of control in the beginning with flipping people's privacy, and they got a 20-year fine and 20-year audit and all this kind of stuff. If you're playing that video game and you play it too hard, and you're not paying attention to culture or the stakeholders or long-term yeah. sort of, you know, the long-term community aspects of your business, right. and then you get into that in the book, you know, you're, it's going to come back and bite you on the ass at some point. Well, that's really, I think, ultimately the point. There are some really powerful lessons from, you know, you, you look at the history of these platforms. They're lessons for businesses. Yeah. This is how you prosper over the long term. Right. And those same lessons apply to our society. Right. This is how you prosper over the long term. And, and, and ultimately, we're going to be here for the long term. And, and, and we, have some pretty serious, <laughs> we have some pretty serious problems. I, you know, I put climate change way up there, but it's actually deeply intertwined with this problem of uh, shared prosperity. Yeah. Because you know, part of what has you know, led us down the path of uh, you know, failure is this looting, extractive behavior by our financial elites that have basically said, oh my gosh, give money to workers? Why would we want to do that? Yeah. You know, I mean- Because they're uh, customers. <laughs> yeah. Because like they, they busted Kip, Tim Cook on this. It was like people in the app store, the- Apple stores yeah. in the physical Apple stores were making nothing. Like they were getting terrible pay. Right. And, and why and does Apple have to do this? So they can get billions of dollars to Carl Icahn in the form of, of stock buybacks. That's ridiculous. Right. You know, they have like, so much money they've printed. Right. right. It's, just it's like pay people 20 bucks an hour. Right. There are companies that need to cut costs to survive, to be competitive. Apple's not one. <laughs> but Apple's not one. But it's also true way more across the economy than you think. I, I actually wrote a piece about um, Carrier there. Yeah, which Trump uh, was which saying. Trump was saying, you know, but the fact was, I did the math back of the napkin. I don't have access to their detailed financials, but maybe they'd save $50, $75 million a year. But Who the cares? parent company was spending $12 billion a year on stock buybacks. Right. So give me a break. You got $12 billion. You can't tell me that you have to save the money. The reason why you have to save the money is so your stock price will go up and your right. executives will get more money and your investors will get more money. And it's this forced reallocation of benefit from society and workers to a small number of people. And we have to stop that. We have to actually have a little bit more foresight. Yeah. Uh, because well, if we is, do, the world will, will be a much better place. This is a good segue to this chart, which I thought was um, probably the best chart or moment in the book for me so far. I'm only halfway through the book. But um, in this chart, we're looking at... Uh, what, what do you call these four quadrant well, tarts? Well, this is, is there actually, a technical this, name? Well, this is a description. Uh, this is actually uh, in the context of a discipline called scenario planning. Scenario planning. Got and it. in scenario planning, uh, what they do is they look at, uh, they say basically most forecasting uh, goes wrong because they don't, take into account widely divergent futures. Right. So this is uh, was originally developed uh, for dealing with the oil industry. And, and the example that Peter Schwartz gives in his book, The Art of the Long View, which kind of introduced this, this technique, uh, was uh, it was in, the, I think, the 1980s. There was a, uh, uh, there was, they were trying to do, somebody was trying to do scenario planning for oil drilling equipment. And, you know, there was the 15% scenario, growth scenario, and the 5% growth scenario, and the 25% growth scenario. And what actually happened was it turned out there was a, uh, some big lo tax loophole, which meant that there was a huge amount of money flowing into, uh, like you know, dr drilling equipment. Yep. Congress repealed the loophole. And the actual reality was it just fell off a cliff. And the, and the real scenario was, you know, 100% decline. Wow. And nobody had actually even thought about that. So what they uh, developed was a discipline where you try to imagine radically different futures. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is you try to think of some different axes on which uh, the world might change. And so in, in this particular graph, uh, you know, I've, I've basically got um, – one axis, the vertical graph, uh, is, well, do we optimize for the owners of the machines or do we optimize for everyone? That creates a vertical in one direction. The other is uh, uh, the horizontal axis is from machines do all the work to technology enables new kinds of work. Right. So here we're trying to think about these uncertain futures. And so when you cross these two lines, you end up with uh, four quadrants. And the bottom left quadrant is the best because it's like, if you optimize for the owners of the machines, let's say Google owns a bunch of machines um, and machines do all the work. Right. 
That, that then is the a people are going to rise up before the machines do. Right, this is a line from Andy McAfee, the author of uh, uh, The Second Machine Age and, and Machine Platform Crowd. We were having breakfast one time and he said, you know, I'm really not worried about, uh, you know, AI taking over because the people will rise up before the machines sure. do. You know, it's like if we basically continue down this path. And so that's the quadrant that you get if we optimize for the owners of the machines and the machines do all the work. You know, if, if we... If, we optimize for the owners of the machine and technology enables new kinds of work, this is the lower right quadrant, we still kind of get what I call the WTF of dismay, you know, right. which is like, oh shit, you know, this is our current economy. You right. know, it's like we're not, you know, if the machines do all the work and we optimize for everyone, this is possible economy of creative abundance. This is the stuff that Cory Doctorow wrote about many years ago in Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom and in his uh, new book, Walk Away. And then when you optimize for everybody, everybody gets a piece of the action and you, the technology enables new kinds of work, which you, you, you specify in the book, like the, uh, what is that? The humans of New York or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I talk about the WTF of astonishment and yeah. this is, uh, you know, just like amazing stuff is happening. Uh, I put podcasts up there. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, all the things that we find like e exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Patreon is in there, but like the examples I use in the book, I, I, I zip line, which is right. this, uh, on demand startup, this delivering blood and medicines in Rwanda Crazy. and other countries, you know, it's like drone, drones. drone delivery. And it's like, you know, what bullshit that we have. Everybody's experimenting. Well, we'll deliver your coffee by drone. It's like, these guys are like, no, you know, people are dying in Rwanda. You know, the leading cause of mortality, among women is postpartum hemorrhage and you've got bad roads you got in develop, underdeveloped uh, hospital infrastructure you can't stock blood everywhere but guess what we can get it anywhere in the country in 15 minutes with a drone and it's like they got this backing of uh, of silicon valley and i go that's what is that's, that that's the WTF of, of, of uh, astonishment. You know, they've got the backing of the country. Or, or Jeff Huber, his wife died of an uh, aggressive form of cancer. He's like, with Grail, I am freaking going to develop an early blood test for cancer detection. And again, this is capital stepping up, investing in this thing. If they develop an early blood test for cancer, we'll all be astonished, but we'll also be all be richer. But right. it's also that, you know, kind of creative economy, I think that's, uh, I, I kind of will also be there. I, I, I love talking about humans of New York, be, uh, Brandon Stanton's uh, Facebook feed or right. Instagram feed. Uh, you know, if you don't know it, you should check it out. He also publishes uh, uh, books know, his, his books out. And, and he, he makes his living with his books and his uh, his you know, corporate speeches. Uh, he actually, with the feed, he uses it to raise money for charity. He's got something like 25 million followers on Facebook. And all they are are these beautiful, he goes and he finds people on the streets. Right now he's, he's in Russia. Uh, he's been doing it. He, he kind of mined New York for a long time. And, and but, it's interesting. He looked for people who have time yeah, he's, to tell yeah, their story. Well, well, like, well, I'm, yeah. look, I'm optimizing for people who look like they have time. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> one of the stories he told me, we, we walked, actually, he was so busy. It, we actually took a long walk with his dog at night through Central Park. Uh, yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, like, you know, like the... Uh, uh, was one of the ones that kicked him over into fundraising for charity. He didn't, you know, it wasn't originally his business model. It just kind of happened. But um, uh, the first one was a, a kid he met who he uh, he asked her who inspired him. And he said, oh, my, my, my principal at my school. Right. And then he went to the school, interviewed the school, ended up, you know, the, she wanted to raise $35,000 to take her kids from this super poor school to Harvard to say, Just you to can, see what Harvard's like. yeah, you can, you can do anything. And he, you know, kind of puts out a request to his followers and they end up raising, you know, several million dollars and, and, you know, they end up, they, yeah, and they, and they end up going to the white house and, you know, meeting uh, uh, president Obama and so on. But then he does this thing. He describes meeting a woman sitting on a bench that's named after her child, mm. right, in New York, you know, sad looking woman and he interviews her about her child died from some rare form of cancer. And again, he raised like seven or $8 million for the research right. into the disease that took the life of her child. And it's just like, they're just, he, but the thing that's so interesting uh, is he talks, he says he talks to people sometimes 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, and he catches, he just gets this one essential line or paragraph and they're beautiful. And, and I look at this and I go, you know, people are creating new kinds of work on the internet that's beautiful, that's shareable, that uh, we're going to look back on some of these things and go, yeah, that's real. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like, you know, this is a work of great literature, great art. 
And he was just a guy who was on Tumblr who hoped to make a living as a photographer somehow. Crazy, the network effect. And, yeah. you know, that's actually, to me, that's a wonderful, astonishing thing. You know, and the same thing, Patreon, started by Jack Conte be, uh, uh, because he was like, you know, we, he, he was part of a, a musical duo named Pomplamoose, and he was like, you know, Natalie and I had, you know, I think it was three million views of, of, of some video, and he said it turned out a few thousand dollars, and it was like our fans value us more than that, and they've now got you know artists who are putting their work up, you know, podcasters. Yeah, ten, uh, twenty, uh, thirty grand a month. Oh, more than that. Yeah. They've actually got people who are making. I think at the very top, uh, uh, I think one hundred and seventy, hundred and eighty thousand a month. You're kidding. They're yeah, so it's a couple of million dollars. Uh, yeah. I think it's incredible because uh, I, I pay. S- my friend Sam Harris every month through the service to do his podcast. He has no advertising on his podcast. He answers to nobody. And when he wants to do like really, there are discussions he's had on that podcast that you could not do on CNN. You couldn't do in Berkeley. You would literally, they would burn Berkeley to the ground if you have the guy who did the bell curve, right? Very controversial book about intelligence and is it inherited and, where else can you have that discussion without the building being burnt down? Yeah. And it's like super intellectual discussion about it. I don't know where I stand on it. I haven't read the book, but just to be able to have yeah, that conversation no, I, well, independent of media. And the I, I agree. I, I think we are in fact, you know, building a new economy there. And, and you know, um, it's still not as big as it, I think it will be, but you know, there are now, according to, uh, Hank Green, when he started the internet creators guild, something like, uh, 30,000, 40,000 people making a full-time living on YouTube. Makes total sense. Uh, and, and I think that number's gone up. And some of those number people are, again, super high um, uh, high income. And, I, I, you know, we are building a new kind of creative economy. And, again, that's the other thing to remember with, with startups. The future won't be like the past in its details, but it will be like the past in its patterns. Yeah, so it rhymes, right? Is what yeah, there's uh, a great quote from uh, attributed to Mark Twain. I don't know if it's actually no. Mark Twain, but the doesn't repeat itself. history doesn't repeat itself, but it, it sure does rhyme. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good uh, place to end. And here is a final chart for you I'll pull up. Uh, in the book, I think working on stuff that matters, super important. Um, this is where I think angel investing as a career um, is going to become something. You talked about Hank talking about thirty thousand people becoming um, thirty thousand people becoming creators on YouTube and other places. I, I don't see why there couldn't be thirty thousand angel investors in the world working on sponsoring people. Right? This could be That's a whole right. new job. And when you look at this. X, Y, char- what, what do we call well, these four quadrant charts? Yeah, well, this uh, one, again, this is another scenario. This one scenario was actually, plan. this this scenario plan was actually just introducing the idea. I don't spend a lot of time on climate change yeah. in the book, but I was kind of saying, hey, look. Uh, I love this uh, one. It, it, I don't know if Elon Musk uh, you know, actually did a scenario planning exercise, but. Um, he did say this at some point, like the, yeah, <laughs> the cost. But, would be but, but, you know, if you think about, uh, this really illustrates how scenario planning works. You know, the, you can kind of go, okay, there's, uncer- there's not real scientific uncertainty, but there's certainly political uncertainty whether the problem exists or not. So right. that's, that's one axis, axis, right? Yeah. So I have this x-axis, the problem is slow or non-existent, or the problem, the problem is fast. It, it changes fast and it's a big problem. And then the, the, the vertical you know, axis is whether the response is slow or non-existent up to it's fast and big. And you kind of look again, you get four quadrants, uh, slow, non-existent response. Uh, uh, and, and if the problem is slow or non-existent, well, you get business as usual. If you have a slow, non-existent response and the problem is in fact fast and big, you get societal collapse. Yeah. Uh, you know. In other words, if global warming is a thing and we don't respond, you get societal we're screwed. collapse. We're screwed, right? But if you respond fast and it isn't something... Yeah, you get this huge innovation premium, i.e., you know, Elon Musk is doing super well whether or not climate change Electric works. Electric cars have their own... That's and right. solar panels have their own value. Yeah, so the, the, you, you've invested in things that are actually valuable anyway. Hmm. You know, so... Uh, and then, of course, in the in the you know upper right quadrant, it, you know, if it is a really a problem, we better be, have, have a big fast response. <laughs> so uh, you know, so the point is that this is one of of a new number of tools that I introduce in the book that are really kind of maps or models that you can use uh, to to shape your thinking about your business and about your market and about society as a whole and how you should act. Mm. And uh, so I'm really trying to provide tools for thinking. All right. The book is WTF, What's the Future, and Why It's Up to Us. 
um, by Tim O'Reilly. Is this your first book? Like, well, yes and no. Yeah, uh, because first you of all, you published thousands. Uh, yeah, or I, hundreds. I published. I pu- no, I published thousands of books. Uh, I've also written. You know, my early part of my career, the very first uh, book I wrote was a book about Frank Herbert, a uh, uh-huh. science fiction writer, uh, for some small publisher that went belly up some years later. And uh, I put it up for free on the internet, even though it's their copyright. I said, uh, come find me if you ever you yeah, know, have a problem. With, can but you go to uh, tim.oreilly.com, which is my personal site, You'll and go to the, the little section on science fiction, you'll find that book. As a technical writer in my the early days of my business, I literally wrote hundreds of computer manuals. And right. I've written you know, three or four books over the years for my own company. Uh, usually when I couldn't find someone else to do it. Probably the one I liked the best was a book I did in 1992 called Unix Power Tools, uh, which is a little bit out of date. Although if you still use Linux, uh, you know, command line stuff, you'll find all kinds of good goodies in there. I've always, but I love that book. What I was trying to do there was to uh, sort of, this is 92, the web was just getting started, but I wanted to try to create a hypertext style book with lots and lots of interconnected tips and tricks. And I thought it worked really well. And I've always wanted to do more books like it. We did a few, but I didn't work on them. And then uh, I did another book because I'd hired somebody and they were just not getting it. Uh, we were trying to get in, do books on the PC market. And uh, you I- You just had to gra- just grab the- and, I, I, and I'd hired I'll somebody who was a knowledgeable PC author to do it. And- and, and I was trying to go because I was trying to show what's under the the covers of right. Windows, you know, and like you know, for example, one of the things that I, I knew was that if you actually just did some stuff magic in DOS because it was still layered on top yeah. of DOS, you could uh, command.exe that, that you could basically rearrange your desktop. And and this guy who was the author of you know Windows for Dummies, who I was trying to get to do the books. You can't do that. And I said, sure you can. You go. So I ended up writing the book. It was called Windows 95 in a Nutshell. Huh. And it was just like a quick reference guide uh, to all the cool stuff that you could do in Windows. So uh, just a range of things uh, yeah. over the years. Unix but text processing. Unix text processing. Yeah, this is the first sort of commercial right. book that... Uh, well, congratulations on it. And, and we have the same... Uh, Publisher, Har- publisher Har- Har- Harper Collins Business. And Harper Business. And the same editor, in fact, Hollis. Yeah, Hollis Seinberg. Yeah, uh, and I think pretty. it's uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, again, I'm really excited because of their ability to, you know, kind of push the book out through. Yeah, uh, uh, you still have to do your own work. You still yeah. have to like get out there and do stuff. My uh, the biggest success we've had, I think, as an is doing small groups of people to talk about the book mm. and the topics in it. So we did dim sum in New York, mm. and we had like 150 people come to one dim sum, and 100, 75 or 100 come to the other, and we just had them buy the book. And then I bought them dim sum. So they bought the book for 30 bucks. And then I bought them dim sum for 30 bucks. That's great. And it was just great because those are the people who review the book and read it. And so I think this. So, so they bought the book in advance. How far in we advance We bought it at the you... door. We had them buy it at the door for that. Okay. One, for those ones. Um, but that's, I think, to me, is like this experiential marketing around a book, I think, mm-hmm. is something I've been working on. So I'm going to do like 10 more of these luncheons where I just rent a dim sum hall and have dim sum with 50 or 100 people That's and a do a idea. Q&A and talk to them because this book has the ability to have like a groundswell which is people who read it and it's you know I'm halfway through it and it's really good I mean you're if you get people who are advocating for it and who say hey this really changed my thinking that's where I think books become sort of legendary there's always tricks to like pop it on the first week I'm not interested in that I'm like how do I get three five star reviews a day is what I told my team because if you do that for a year and you get a thousand five star reviews, you ever see a book with a thousand five star yeah, reviews? Oh yeah, you just right. immediately buy it. Yeah. When you stumble no, that's upon so it. true. And the other well, that makes me think of one other thing I want to pass along, which is really kind of related to this idea of creating value for other people. Of all the authors I've ever published, my favorite comment about reviews came from Kathy Sierra, who was the author of a book yeah. called Head First Java, and uh, a number of other books. Like, uh, and uh, she said every time. Somebody wrote a review saying how great the book was. I was disappointed. What I wanted them to say, what made me happy in their reviews was when they told me, when they when they said what they had gotten out of it and how it had made them into a you know more yes, successful the impact, it had. the impact you know of and course. so the thing that I think both you and I hope for from our books is that people get value out of them. Yeah. Well, it, you think about it, it's such an opportunity cost to write a book. I mean, you think right. about you know at the places we both are in our careers. If you're going to spend a thousand hours or five hundred hours or whatever you spend on the book, there's so many other places you could do it to get a bigger reward. 
So mm-hmm. if you do this, it really has to be a labor of love. If it's an if an important person like you is taking the time to write a book, yeah, I mean you have to suffer over it for a year or two. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's mentally very challenging. Well, it's interesting. I talked with Ray Dalio, the 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 uh, hedge fund guy. He's got a book that he's yeah. coming out uh, called. Did you Prince. write it? <laughs> yeah, he did actually, he, and it's actually it's based on something he's he's had a working document inside his company for years, but it's also kind of a a, a business book wrapped in a memoir. Uh, it's an interesting book. It's called Principles, mm-hmm. and it's interesting because I asked him, "Why are you doing this?" He obviously doesn't need the money. He's worth, right. Yeah, he's a you know multi he's a multi billionaire, uh, one of the most successful financial investors uh, you know in history, and he's like. I'm at the stage in my life where I want to give somebody back. I want something back. I want to teach people how I uh, do. His book's about to come out too. Cool. Uh, his book, you know, it's just like I want to teach people how I think and what I have accomplished, how I accomplish what I accomplished. All right, folks, go order the book. You know what to do. WTF, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us by Tim O'Reilly. Pre-order. Please pre-order and share it on social media. We'll see you all. Thanks, Tim. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Service. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.